I'm right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and you know what that means. And if you don't, uh, get used to it. 9 o'clock Eastern time every Wednesday night for Ohio State football talk as we bring on the very best to analyze the Buckeyes. Steve Hellwagon from 247 Sports. Bucknuts, Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone, and Kevin Noon from Rivals Buckeye Grove. Gentlemen, how are we doing this week? Very doing well. good. Doing great. I am as well, and uh, looking forward to this team being challenged. And it may not come this week, but th this is certainly the probable first challenge of the season. This seemed to be that Iowa or Purdue that everyone was searching for during the offseason to say, that's 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 the one. That team's not as good as Ohio State, but that's, that's the one that they're going to go into the lion's den and be challenged and maybe come – back home with a loss for the first time in 2019. All right, Steve, we'll let you uh, take the honors in looking back at uh, Miami and uh, five points on the board. And I, and I heard a ve very curious comment from Justin Fields, and I certainly hope that it was meant in a certain context because I didn't hear it come out of his mouth. I, I saw it in writing in regards to the five to nothing deficit and then making the comment that our coach has been preparing us. Ryan has been, uh, Coach Day has been preparing us the entire season for adversity. And when we met adversity, we were able to to overcome it. Uh, well, you know, there's adversity, then there's real adversity. And I just think that, you know, a lot of times the athletes get trapped into this situation where they get boxed into a corner by people who have agendas and are asking yeah. questions and, you know, people are, are, you know, 76 to 5 game people are looking for any kind of a storyline to grasp onto and to say you guys were in trouble, you know, in the first quarter or whatever. I mean, I don't think anybody was all that concerned. I mean, uh, basically, to start the game, Miami got two first downs, punted Ohio State down inside the, the two yard line. J.K. Dobbins ran for minus one. Now the ball's on the one-yard line, and Ryan Day, by his own admittance, got a little anxious, and he called a double move for the wide receiver that takes some time. They were taking a shot. They were trying to get the ball out to midfield on one play or go 99 yards in one play. By his own admission, with his quarterback standing in the middle of the end zone, it wasn't the right play call. Uh, J.K. Dobbins failed to pick up the blitz coming off the left edge, and the guy knocked the ball away. Uh, from Justin Fields, and it was a safety. Now it's two to nothing, and the defense let them drive 66 yards. They go down to the five yard line and uh, kick a chip shot field goal, and it's five to nothing, seven minutes into the game. I don't think anybody was concerned that Ohio State wasn't going to win the game at that point. So he gets asked afterwards, you know, this is the first real adversity you've had faced. And he just tried to answer the question the best way he could, said, you know, they prepared us for these moments. Real adversity is coming. Uh, they're going to play a team with commensurate talent uh, coming up. Uh, just to put a bow on Miami, it was great that so many young players got to play in the game. None of the starters, or if any of them did, I didn't see it, played the second half. And four true freshmen scored touchdowns in this game, which may be some kind of a record. There was a game in, in 96 that I referenced, Pittsburgh, with Wiley and Boston were both true freshmen, and they may have combined for four touchdowns as two guys in that game. That's about the only other thing that I can think of that kind of relates to this, the number of touchdowns and the number of guys. So this was a positive game to get people some experience and get them out there in front of the lights, but we're four games into this thing, and the team truly hasn't been tested yet, but that's about to change uh, coming up uh, with Nebraska. Uh, team, you know, again, they'll play in front of 85,000 people in prime time. And uh, again, you know, Nebraska is not a top 10 team by any means. They're still not where they need to be defensively. But with Adrian Martinez, Ohio State found out last year, I think he threw for 250 and ran for another 70 or 80. And it accounted for like three or four touchdowns in that game, 36-31. So, He's a formidable opponent, and uh, we'll see if the Ohio State defense is for real. Full disclosure here. For probably the first time in, I don't know, maybe 35 or 40 years, I did not watch the game live. I did not watch one play of the game on the DVR. 
it hit 330. And because of what I'm doing here, this is the first time this has ever happened. It hit 330. It hit 345. It was like 415. And it hit like I'm watching Texas A&M Auburn. I'm watching all these other games. Then it actually hit me. Ohio State's playing. They didn't play at noon. That's right. I haven't even. They're, they're playing right now. And I and I flip it on. It's seven to five. It was beautiful here. My boy and I went out for two and a half hours, shot baskets, threw the football around. I DVR the game. We were driving home. I said, what do you think the final score is? And he's like, ah, they won by 24. And I said, oh, I guess they'll win by th- they won by 32. We saw the final score. I just didn't bring myself to go back and watch this thing. It's 77 to five. Kevin, think- Tony, before we move on to more important matters, did, did you take anything away before, t- you know, t- I see Tony's disappointment just written all over his face. Uh, besides that, anything from this game? Terrell Pryor would call you a fake Buckeye and he would throw in a little expletive in there as well. After what you just told us, I can't believe that I, the <laughs> adversity thing is, I think Ryan day tried to give those guys some adversity by throwing deep from the the two from the one yard line because the first play was a loss of one from the two yard line so he's like you know what he says he wants to be aggressive so he's like well let's just let's throw in a, a post corner and, and or you know, and see how it goes and well jk didn't quite do his job and that's happened a couple times this year and when you get up to these this miami game when you can do whatever you want sometimes you have to do some things that you know let's make things a little bit more difficult than they need to be because we know uh, two points isn't going to win us or lose us this game. So I think that was a good thing. I actually like that play call, even though it ended up in, in disaster because, you know, eventually you're going to have to call that again. So this is a better opportunity than doing it in practice and you can learn from it because it failed. What do you say, Kevin? Anything from last week, or should we just dive into Nebraska? Yeah, I was going to say, just because there's 76 points doesn't mean there's 76 takes from this game. <laughs> thorough butt whipping, and I agree with everything that, that Steve and Tony both said there. Um, it was great seeing the true freshman involvement there. Uh, they got a hell of a, uh, hell of a, a guy in Garrett Wilson, and – Jameson Williams was very exciting when he caught his pass and he, you know, as soon as he caught it and I saw just a little bit of green grass, I remember leaning over to my interns and saying, he's gone. And he was, and then Marcus Crowley and Steel Chambers getting touchdowns as well. And uh, the stakes are going to be much higher this week going to Lincoln. I know we're going to talk about that, but, uh, you know, I think it was a good game uh, in terms of getting everybody some action. Nobody had more than 45 snaps and that was on the defensive side. Uh, No, uh, the offensive line played 32 and then they were able to bring in the second team line. So everybody's going to be going into this game pretty well rested in terms of not having a lot of uh, fatigue from the last game. And uh, you know, they're going to need it because it, this could be a four quarter game. We will talk Nebraska. We will talk a ton Nebraska, but as uh, Steve mentioned in the private chat, I think Ohio state fans would appreciate us staying back there in week four last weekend for for something for a final score that was even more satisfying than 77 to five, it was 35 to 14 and it wasn't anywhere close to being that close. And because Kevin, you said Wisconsin was going to run away with this game and win by at least 17 points. I will do you the honors of talking about Wisconsin's route. Sorry, Gerd, me. (laughs) Um, I wasn't me because I said Michigan was going to win that game. um, I, before the game, uh, the Hell Wagons had a nice little tailgate with uh, some cupcakes and hot dogs and everything else, and we had the game on there. And I may have been full of bravado here on Mark Rogers' show, but when I was there, it's like, well, this, it's not like this game's, game's ever going to be 28 nothing, which, which it was. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was surprised more with how inept Michigan looked than how great Wisconsin looked and I think we're still going to need to see a little bit more both teams before we really know what's what but uh as we kind of alluded to on this show uh Charbonnet he was window dressing he really didn't play uh they for whatever reason didn't until until garbage time throw it up there for the receivers for Michigan and they made some plays at that point but it was a real anemic looking offense the offensive line definitely struggled and Jonathan Taylor did Jonathan Taylor type of things. And of course, you know, it has to come at me. I'll, I'll, I'll own when I take the L. I've been so critical of Jack Cohn, but he looked pretty good in that game. But, uh, you know, I think that, I think he's going to have to play some more uh, 
stout defenses before I'm going to really, you know, buy uh, an admission to the uh, Marching and Chowder Society for Jack Cohn because that Michigan defense, I'm sorry, is just not very good in terms of they just don't have the depth of talent that they had last year. And could they be there by the end of the season when they play Ohio State? Time will tell, but I'm, I'm going to lean towards saying no. I just don't think they have the I don't think they have the horses to do it. And the running game's not going to be working quite as well in future games, you would think, for Jack Cohn to be able to just kind of play action off of that and benefit from the, the, you know, the wide open spaces that that creates. Steve, uh, the team up north having some issues. Yeah, this, uh, as I joked routinely off and on, uh, just imagine uh, if this didn't happen to be their year as they portrayed that it was going to be their year long and long over and again. But, uh, you know, um, all the problems that we've talked about low these many years came home to roost. They're not physical enough. Uh, when Donovan Peoples-Jones doesn't play, they're not dynamic enough. Uh, you know, people want to give all this, put lay all this at Shea Patterson's feet. And I just don't think that they've surrounded him with enough to where – uh, you can lay all this at his feet. And, uh, you know, it, it's easy to beat a dead horse, but when you think about this, and, and I talked about this in the off season when I did a survey of the recruiting classes, the material that you put in equals the result you're going to get out. There's a reason why Michigan is not mentioned in the same breath right now as Georgia, Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio State. It's because they don't have the talent to match up with those other teams. Uh, maybe on, on one given Saturday out of 10, they'll pull off an upset. But week in and week out, they're not going to beat top teams. And what we saw with Wisconsin was what you do <clears> – excuse me – what you do when the chips are down and everybody doubts you coming off of – what was for them a terrible season last year, I think eight and five, when they're accustomed to winning 10, 11, 12 games. They were 12 and 0 two years ago when they played Ohio State. <clears throat> um, I think they then won their bowl game to finish 13 and one, I believe. They, they aspire for great things. And that is what you saw Chris and his staff did. They harnessed the human spirit and they put a team that would have beaten anybody on the field uh, last Saturday, anybody in the country that would have matched up with them, uh, they probably would have beaten them. And that's the kind of beating that they put on Michigan. And Michigan is not capable of rising to that level right now. And they've got some very difficult games ahead of them. What is it? In two weeks they play Iowa or a week and a half they play Iowa. Uh, still have to play – uh, Penn State, Michigan State, Maryland is even possibly in play now on them. Uh, and has been dying to break through against them. Then Ohio State at the end. I mean, I just wonder if we're witnessing the beginning of the end for Jim Harbaugh because, you know, all the fort, as I like to say, the Dodds in the 40s have come out and uh, basically identified that he's not the guy and the emperor has no clothes. And five years into this, uh, they're no better off than they were when he got there. And, and I was doing a chat the other night. People were talking about, you know, Michigan, this, Michigan, that. I go, guys, Minnesota in the 30s and 40s won national championships. And in the seven decades since then, they've been middle of the road. Are we, be, are we seeing the Minnesotification of the Michigan football program? I don't know. I don't know because – they very well could end could come to Columbus ten and one, or they very well could come to Columbus seven and four. I mean, it's it's within the realm of possibility. And they were talking national championship with this group. So some people were. I don't know. I'll go back to what I said in the offseason. They have to beat Ohio State one time before I would ever pick them to win the division. They have and to beat Ohio State left. one time and show me that they can do it. And this team is currently Currently put together, maybe Peoples Jones makes a difference if he gets back in there to provide a vertical threat. But defensively, they they had no answer. Didn't they get out gained on the ground like three twenty to forty or something? They had no answer. I I don't know, Tony. I know you're dying to talk Michigan. You write a Michigan column every week, and uh, I'm sure you've got some talking points on this as well. 
Mark, you had something to say? You know what, Tony? Take it away. You've been <laughs> waiting. You you deserve it. Go to it. I'll have well, something to say, I'm sure. I'll say, Steve and Kevin were not the only people enjoying cupcakes at 12 o'clock on Saturday because Wisconsin's <laughs> offensive line had quite a few of them themselves. And Michigan's defensive line, they played six scholarship defensive linemen in that game. One is a former fullback. Another is a transfer from Central Michigan, a graduate transfer. So you have six guys. Ohio State was without four scholarship defensive linemen last week. They still played 10. And they threw in an 11th walk-on who had a a half a tackle for loss. So the the lack of recruiting at Michigan, they have have so many washouts. Uh, Their 2017 class, I think they – signed nine defensive linemen, including the fullback, uh, Martin, Ben Martin. And I think that's his name. I'm, But anyway, those nine guys, I think there's like two or three left. And none of them, they have no impact players on defense. Cornerback Levert, Levert Hill might be their, their most impactful guy. Um, Khalid Hudson was good two years ago, had eight tackles for loss in one game, but is now just a guy. And the entire defense is just a guy. Third and short against Wisconsin, they had they were playing two defensive linemen and four linebackers, and they were just getting rolled. And on a on a fourth and goal, or they were um, or on a goal line situation, they again had a an inside linebacker who is a former walk on safety, Jordan Glasgow, ba- basically playing three technique defensive tackle. And it's easy to um, you know what happened. He got pushed back four yards into the end zone, and this. I don't know. The, the, the talent isn't there. We thought maybe you, you have a lot of faith that Don Brown can just reload. They did it two years ago when they replaced like 10 starters, but then you had Devin Bush and Rashawn Gary coming in and stuff like that. And they don't have that this year because the recruiting isn't there. And even their best recruit recruits aren't playing guys like um, Chris Hinton is a top 30 defensive end. He doesn't play Daxton Hill, five-star safety. He doesn't play. And, you know, you wonder uh, what what this transfer portal is going to look like for Michigan in December. I don't, you know, I, I've received some some uh, mass casualties there because I, as I wrote in Michigan Monday, it's just a joyless program. You look at the players, nobody looks like they're having a good time. Jim Harbaugh looks miserable. It just looks like a terrible place to be right now. And I don't know how you turn that around with him, with Jim Harbaugh, because I think this is his fifth year. This is what Michigan is under him. But again, this is also what Michigan is. You know, they're not national title contenders. They're 9-10 win max. And every decade, they make a push. You know, 2006, they made a push. They were number two. 2016, I think they were 20 or number three when Ohio State played them. So it takes them a while and, and – uh they finally get there, but that, that's – they're not – I mean, Michigan State has been in the playoffs. Michigan State has won Big Ten titles. Michigan hasn't. I don't know, can can Matt Campbell take Michigan further than Jim Harbaugh? Maybe. I think Jim Harbaugh is tapped out. He's maxed out, and he just looks like he's he'd rather be golfing or playing with his kids. Yeah, I, I checked out the news conference uh, from Jim Harbaugh. And, you know, what can he say? Because he's got to protect his players. He's got to take as much blame as possible. And ultimately, he is responsible for what's going on. But he said all the cliched things. You know, it's not acceptable. It's not good enough. The players won't tolerate it. They don't believe it's good enough. I'm saying it's not good enough. We weren't good enough. We were outcoached. We were out schemed. We were out hustled. We were out played. Well, as soon as you bring up the term out hustled, then that points to the players. Are the players not trying hard enough? And as soon as you say out schemed, that comes right back at him to say, why are you out schemed? You should be out coaching the other coaching staff. So, but of course, at one point when he was asked about details, he says, well, I could go through all the details, but I don't know that you want me to go through all the details. Please go through the details. Let us know where are you being out hustled and out schemed because that points right to coaches and players. And it's obviously that's the case because you're supposed to be more talented than that Wisconsin team. But I think Tony spoke to it. All three of you, I believe, spoke to it when Iowa shows up 
they're not as talented as Michigan, but Wisconsin wasn't supposed to be either. But we know one thing out of Iowa. They know who they are. They know what they're going to do. They know what their identity is, and they're going to play their rear ends off. And Michigan better better buckle up and be ready for that game. This is the last week with Michigan plays Rutgers this week. This will be the last week they do not play an opponent that will come in and expect to beat Michigan. <clears throat> When Iowa comes in, they'll expect to beat them. When when Michigan goes to Illinois, they will think they have a chance to win. When Michigan goes to Maryland, they will think they have a chance to win. Everybody that plays Michigan this year, after seeing what they've done and looking at the talent that they have up front, is going to think that they have a real good shot to beat Michigan. And sometimes that's half the battle. Because when you go into a game thinking, you know what, we're not going to be able to beat them, you're not. And when you go in with that confidence that if, if Army can do it, almost – and if Wisconsin can do it that easily, you know, Iowa is a poor man's Wisconsin. Why can't they do it? I, I think a lot of there's a lot of confidence going around the Big Ten when it comes to Michigan right now. Absolutely. Uh, Army uh, trotted out a field goal kicker, a freshman who had never tried a collegiate attempt. So if he hits, if, it, you know, Michigan did nothing to avert the kick, if he connects, it's really ugly right now, but that Wisconsin rear end case. I did watch that game, or at least I watched the first. I thought I was buckled in to watch what I thought was going to be the game of the weekend, even more so than Georgia and Notre Dame. But what I got was just an annihilation in every way, shape, or form. And I didn't watch anything past halftime of that game. All right. We got the best in Buckeye talk mm-hmm. with Kevin Noon from uh, Buckeye Grove, Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone, and Steve Hellwagon from buck nuts we talk ohio state football here each and every week just don't be selfish and take this in yourself Uh, let your social media acquaintances out there know your family and friends that we're here every wednesday night at nine o'clock eastern time steve i'll let you start off the nebraska discussion because you really saw them as being um, a team that was going to explode from that four and eight season last year scott frost taking hold of year two based on how well they played down the stretch, what they had coming back, especially explosive players on offense led by Adrian Martinez as a real threat this year. So your thoughts about the Huskers uh, and what they'll have in store for the Buckeyes Saturday night. Yeah, it's crazy. In the preseason, I think I had them all the way up at number 10 or 11 in my top 25. I was real (laughs) bullish on my Scott Frost and my uh, Adrian Martinez and the Colorado game was a, a dose of cold water. I'm sitting there looking at my computer. I see they're up 17 to nothing on the road, mind you, at Colorado at halftime. I'm thinking, walk in the park for my guys, the Huskers. Here we go. And uh, I had them win in the West over uh, Wisconsin, which obviously is still in play, but because uh, that was a non conference loss. They gave up 24 points. In the fourth quarter, in Colorado, forced overtime and then got the uh, the field goal uh, in uh, overtime and won the game. And what was it? Uh, they turned it over, I think, in the overtime, and that ended their period. Or they m- missed a field goal to tie it, whatever it was. And then uh, came back home, beat Northern Illinois like a drum, which is what you're supposed to do coming off of a tough game like that. Northern Illinois, usually a MAC contender, and they handled them pretty easily. Then last week, they, they went out to Illinois and they trailed the entire game. And you looked up and they're down anywhere from, uh, I don't know, 3 to 10 or maybe even as much as 14 points at one point. But you always had this sense in the back of your head that Illinois would find a way to give that one back to Nebraska. And the cream did rise to the top at the end. I think there were a couple controversial calls in there. But Adrian Martinez and Washington and Spielman – uh, just too much uh, for Illinois' defense. And so now here comes Nebraska, 3-1 and one overall, 1-0 one in the Big Ten. Uh, still not getting a lot of respect. Uh, people are holding the – they only had a few uh, votes in the coaches' poll, uh, and nobody put them on an AP poll ballot this week at 3-1. and one. And uh, here's Ohio State, number five in the AP poll, moving up a spot uh, with Oklahoma being idle. Uh, the pollsters moved Ohio State up a spot and moved Oklahoma down one. And uh, it's a total setup. I mean, when you look at it, Nebraska's got the team, as we mentioned earlier, that played Ohio State very close last year in Columbus. And we're going to find out if uh, Ohio State's defense is for real this week. 
Uh, Nebraska is going to put up a lot of points in, in a lot of the games that they play. Uh, 42 against Illinois this past week. Martinez, as mentioned, uh, he can go for 250, 300 yards passing and 100 yards rushing, the drop of a hat. Washington as a 100 yard per game rusher. Spielman's a game breaker at wide receiver. And they've got other guys, uh, Wandale Robinson as well, that, that are capable. So Ohio State's defense is going to be tested. Uh, it's going to be a fun game, I think. There's going to be a lot of plays made. And what it's going to come down to is whether Ohio State's defense can keep Nebraska out of the end zone when the Huskers get the ball into the red zone. And that, uh, to me, is going to come down to the cornerback play with Arnett, Okuda, Wade, uh, Fuller at safety. Are they going to make plays on balls in the end zone to knock passes away, or are they going to give up uh, touchdowns? And that's what it's going to come down to. The pass rush with Chase Young, are they going to get there against Adrian Martinez, who's capable of moving the pocket side to side? That's a big question. So he keeps plays alive and uh, can be a, a very difficult guy to go against. And Ohio State is uh, in for a real challenge, I feel, uh, this week with Nebraska. I mean, I was obviously bullish on them uh, coming into the season. I don't think they've solved their defensive issues. Uh, 34 to Colorado in overtime, 38. 38 to Brandon Peters in Illinois uh, this past week on the road, both games on the road. But if they can't hold those teams under 30, and here's Ohio State with this ability to run the football and throw the football – uh, what do you think Ohio State's going to score against them? I think it's going to be in the 40s at least. And with Ohio State's defense, I have a hard time wondering that uh, Nebraska is going to get much more than about 21 points. So I have to really think about a score if we're going to go on record for that. I know the line's like 17. I have to, you know, I'm not going to cop out and say 38-21 or something stupid like that. But I, I need, I need to really put put some brain power into this one. <laughs> I, I, I look at, uh, you know, Steve brings up the points about uh, the Nebraska offense, but this game really comes down to me about the Nebraska defense. I started doing some deep dive for our tail the tape piece that'll come out tomorrow on Buckeye Grove. Um, the four games is a real small sample size for really looking at national rankings and, and extrapolating it across what a team's going to look like the whole season. You know, you have one bad outing against the team that's in question. It, it can really tank your number, but the best rushing defense or the best rushing offense that Nebraska has faced this season has been South Alabama, who's 60th out of 130 teams in the nation. I'm, I'm sorry, 54th for Illinois, 60th for South Alabama. Colorado was 86th. The Northern Illinois was 127th. Ohio State, the worst rushing Ohio State team in terms of balance in a long time was last year. Ohio State ran for 229 yards against Nebraska. The year before that, they ran for 279. The year before that, they ran for 238. I like J.K. Dobbins to go for 200 in this game, honestly. Uh, could, thunderstorms can move into the area. It could be a wet track. I think that they do a little bit more ball control. I don't think that they're going to go into a shell. I don't think we're going to see – we're not going back to maybe some of the more trestle-esque type of offense in there. I think we're going to see them still grip it and rip it. But I think it's going to be more, uh, more, more running. What happens when we look at the passing offenses they've gone against? The best uh, passing offense they went against was Colorado's 29th. Their quarterback, Steven Montez, 28 of 41, 375 and two touchdowns. <laughs> Northern Illinois is 45th. They had two quarterbacks in that game. They went 28 completions, like 49 attempts, 276. I don't think this Nebraska defense has a prayer of slowing down the Ohio State offense. I think, I think the 12th man for Nebraska is going to have to be Mother Nature. Because I don't think that just with the 11 guys they've got out there and probably not many black shirts, I think they're going to be in trouble. And as much as Nebraska fumbles the ball, I don't know that they want rain. And I think they fumbled it nine or 11 times in four games. You start throwing some wet, wet footballs in there and things will get even worse. And Ohio State has they'll – be, they'll be fine running the ball if they need to run for 400 yards, you know, just doing the read option with Justin Fields, who I expect to keep it a little bit more this week if need be. But when you're talking, Kevin, you're talking like 375 yards passing. I think we could see that as well from Justin Fields because this will maybe if he plays four four quarters, you, know, you project to what he does when they need him to throw the ball. Um, yeah, he could throw for 375. I don't know that uh, it'll come to that with 
the way if, if you watched um the the Nebraska Illinois game and and really some of the other Nebraska games I I'm not I've not been super impressed with Nebraska's defense and the Ohio State running game with the with the offensive line playing the way it is they've been challenged this week their first three games all five offensive linemen graded out as champions then against Miami when they score 76 points none of them did and so they were challenged this week to play their best week and I assume they'll take that seriously and you know, this is what you brought Justin Fields here for. You know, it's for games like this to make life difficult on the opposing defense. But yeah, as, as Kevin said, JK is going to have a big day. I think you look at what Illinois did to that defense running for 220 some yards, something like that, last week when Brandon Peters is your quarterback and there's no passing threat. I think they threw for maybe 80 yards and you're still running the ball. And that Reggie Corbin went for, uh, I think he had a 66 yarder. Another guy had like a 38 yarder. So they'll give up big plays. They'll get pushed around a little bit. But it's the uh, the Nebraska offensive line. Uh, Illinois was in the backfield a lot in that game. They got they got beat up. And you're talking about an high state defense that is leading the nation, tied for the nation's lead in sacks. Nebraska, only two teams in the Big Ten have given up more sacks than the Husker offensive line. So, yeah, Adrian Martinez can't escape, but he's he's had to escape a lot. And this week you talk to the Ohio State defensive line, they are talking about keeping him contained and just collapsing the pocket around him and then having him just scramble into a defensive tackle, basically, or, or maybe a blitzing linebacker. But he does pose huge problems. I'm, I'll be interested to see what they do. Do they you know, spy – Malik Harrison with him. Is this the game where you see more Baron Browning than you do Tough Borland because of that spread offense and the speed? Is this where you see more of the bullet in Brendan White than you do Pete Werner? We saw last year Pete Werner against J.D. Spielman. Those matchups did not go well for Ohio State, but a lot of those matchups against wide receivers last year did not go well. And Nebraska has a ton of speed out wide and at running back, I'm looking forward to seeing how these uh, the Ohio State secondary matches up and how they perform. And, you know, Ohio State might have three best corners in the Big Ten. They're going to be tested, but I don't expect Adrian Martinez to have much time. Yeah, statistically, this game uh, against Illinois for Nebraska was a bit curious. They did have to come back with a 15-3 to scoring margin in the fourth quarter. I had the game on at times, but there were other games on, so I wasn't really locked into what was going on. But Illinois, again, an eight-point lead in the fourth quarter. They ended up with only 14 first downs. You mentioned the passing inefficiency for Illinois with Brandon Peters at quarterback throwing for 78 yards. They rushed for 221, but they were outgained 673 to 299. Out first down to 32 to 14, but Nebraska turned it over four times, kept the game close, and Illinois had a fighting shot there in the last five minutes of the game at home. Um, Can I jump in real quick on that? Too? Absolutely. Chase Young had two uh, strip sacks in the game. <laughs> That's been the mantra. I mean, they talked about mm -hmm. that. We've had a chance to talk to players two days already this week. A sack is great, but a strip sack is what they're going for right mm -hmm. now. You have an offense in Nebraska that is playing fast and loose with the ball. Uh, nobody's been able to block Chase Young. If Jonathan Cooper comes back, they're going to be that much more dangerous. We'll find out the status of B.B. Landers at the end of the week. As some of these pieces are coming back in, and Chase Young is playing otherworldly right now, uh, You know the reason Illinois was able to stay in the lead for 50-some minutes in the game is because of those turnovers. Ohio State, very opportunistic. They weren't happy with the number of takeaways they had last year. They've really put a lot of onus on it this year. I think that's where this game could get away if Ohio State is able to, to be plus two, plus three, plus four, dare I say, in the turnover margin. And Chase Young has 11 sacks in his last six games, a six-game streak of at least one sack. This year, all four games, he's had at least one and a half. So have fun with that guy on Saturday. Yeah, I don't think there's any question that, um, that Ohio State's a much better team. <clears throat> not not in ridiculous blowout fashion like they've enjoyed the first four games of the season, but especially on the road, uh, Nebraska has athletes. If Nebraska has anything, they have probably the most dangerous quarterback in the conference, and they have skill position players to match. Uh, uh, Maurice Washington is a, an elite running back. Uh, Diedrich Mills is really good. The transfer from Georgia Tech, they've got speed on the outside. J.D. Spielman's very accomplished, but their offensive line 
should get manhandled at times by Ohio State. It's not nearly as good as it needs to be. Uh, and the defense, yeah, has improved, but it was one of the worst in the Big Ten in making any kind of havoc plays, disruptive plays last year, and it's a little bit better this year, but not at the rate to play with an Ohio State. But I got to I got to think, what was the rhetoric among the four of us in whatever corners we were talking prior to the Purdue game last year and the Iowa game the year before? So on a given night, what can happen? As long as they don't play in a monsoon. And it wasn't quite a monsoon, but it was very windy at Purdue. And as long as Chase Young doesn't get a bad – I mean, bad – it was a targeting call, but, I mean, doesn't get ejected the way that uh, Bosa did at Iowa. I mean, we got to remember, those they, they got beat – we can make the argument that they kind of quit, especially at the end of the Purdue game. But I, I have a, re- I was, I did Omaha radio earlier today. I, I, if if Ohio State doesn't win this game, it's because Nebraska was the better team that night. Ohio State made a lot of mistakes and something, you know, something yeah. went awry. I don't see Ohio State n- not respecting Nebraska, not you know, not going in thinking that this is going to be a challenge. It's really easy for the four of us here on this show to say, well, they, you know, they should whip them from stem to stern or whatever, but that's definitely not the message going on in the Woody. I don't see this being the game that has that type of potential in terms of it being that super fluky type of game. I I see one of those on the schedule, but it's not this one. Well, defensive tackle Haskell Garrett said tonight that they've had this game circled since February. So when we're talking about Iowa and Purdue, you know that it's easy for the them to do the math in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center about the the night games in the Big Ten West and what has happened the last couple of years. So they've they've had this game circled. They've been looking forward to it because this is their first real big road test, and this is where they get to see uh, the, all of the hard work pay off, so to speak. And you get past this one, and this is this is one of those. Um, steps on the way Ryan Day had it as sort of um, segments of the season you get the first six games or so and then you get you get a break and then then you've got the second half of the season so they are marching through this first half of their their season and this is one of their last milestones before they get that break and I you know we, we said it at Purdue Purdue game last year prior to it was seen as a roadblock or as a speed bump or seen as a trap game. So you're thinking, well, after what happened to Iowa, there's no way that they're going to fall for it again. And then, of course, you see so us saying there's no way they're going to fall for it again. But uh, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe after two years in a row, you start to take it seriously. But this has been a pretty serious team. Um, Ryan Day, the last couple of weeks, hasn't necessarily been his joking self. He's been a little bit more serious. And I think he's trying to keep his team on edge for this game. Well, certainly last year we saw the warning signs, right, Steve? We saw the warning signs against Oregon State and teams like that, and they had already played TCU and and gotten hit up a little bit defensively with some big plays in that game. We're not seeing any warning signs, and again, the competition's not been there, but um, they were lighting up against light competition uh, last year, and this team's been rock solid. Steve? (laughs) Yeah, I uh, I think this defense is night and day better than it was last year. You, you saw those big hitters last year early in the season, and you just thought to yourself, this isn't normal, this isn't right. And uh, I'm not sure what the longest play to date has been. I know they put Arnett back in a game, and he gave up a long pass, I think, uh, maybe the game before this one. I don't know. what. Maybe it wasn't Indiana. Maybe it was Cincinnati, I guess. I don't know. But – uh, yeah, it, it just – those big plays, those big chunk plays haven't been there. And uh, Indiana had to resort to, uh, uh, you know, a double pass basically to a tight end leaking behind the defense to score their only touchdown. So, uh, to me, that was a dominating performance. Uh, you know, you have guys across the board who are playing their best football right now with uh, Malik Harrison at linebacker, uh, Baron Browning in the reps that he gets, Chase Young. Uh, 
Pascal Garrett is coming off a game where he made two plays in the backfield at defensive tackle. So even though they didn't have Robert Landers in the last game, uh, they still had guys making impact plays. It, it looks like it's a possibility. Well, Robert Landers seemed like he was 100% fine coming off the field. I think that was strictly a precautionary thing last week against an outmanned opponent for him to skip the Miami game, it would seem to me. Uh, Jonathan Cooper, there's talk that maybe he'll be back. I didn't necessarily see him today, but I wasn't looking for him very closely. Uh, not sure about uh, Tyreek Smith, whether he'll be back this week or not. But again, whether those guys play or don't play, they've got a guy just as good of them right there in the wings waiting to change games, you know, and make a, a negative yardage play. They have like 13 or 14 tackles for loss in this game. That's been a redundant theme that they've had double digit tackles for loss and usually anywhere from three to five sacks in every one of the games so far this season. And, and I say this, I think it's on a weekly basis. You, know, you get 10 or 11 possessions, maybe 12 in a game, and if Ohio State's averaging one negative yardage play per possession, you put them behind and down a distance on nearly every possession that they have, and that's a lot to overcome. Add in the fact that Drew Crisman with the, the punting is going to back the opponent up deep in their own end. Add in the fact that Ohio State can flip field position with special teams with some dynamic punt returns here and there. Uh, Garrett Wilson had a 50-yarder this past week, and he'll probably get some more work there. But, again, their biggest thing is just fielding the punt. And, uh, you, you know, uh, two block punts and a block field goal. So Ohio State's doing all those little things on special teams that you have to do uh, to set up your offense and defense for success. And uh, they win the field position battle every week. And it's just kind of a uh, tried and true uh, recipe for victory. Uh, they have a word for it. I don't, what do they call it? The plan for victory, I guess. Something like that. But uh, they follow it to a T, it seems like, every week. Cheryl states here, why no likes for me? I uh, hate the Buckeyes. Uh, Ohio State fans are used to it, but not me. I'm just the messenger here. We just bring the, the, the talk. Illinois had 15 tackles for loss against this Nebraska offense and offensive line last week. 15. That's, that's not good. And yeah, Illinois has some athletes there, but Ohio state's going to bring in a few more. And I think Illinois, they, they also have their defensive end might be with chase young leading the nation in sacks. But yeah, as Steve uh, mentioned Jonathan Cooper. He came off the field. I, I saw him walking, you know, hopping around, running around, looking fine, looking like he wants to play. Obviously, he does, smiling, but he's always smiling. And I mean, he, if you didn't know he was going through something, he sure looked like he was ready to go. And we, do, we don't even know what he's going to add to this team yet. We know what he was last year, and he has talked all offseason about being better than that. And he knows that this is his last opportunity. And, um, you know, I, I, I have no idea what it's going to look like, but it's going to be better than it has, you know, better than it than they've been so far. I just wonder, um, you know, can he come back? And we don't know what's going on with Tyreek Smith. Uh, do they just switch out? And in which case, you know, it, it's it's pretty amazing how many guys that are on that there are on this defensive line that they can just continue to put put guys in, bring in a new five star and let him do what he does. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's Larry Johnson for you, I guess. And it's also the way Ryan Day and, and Urban Meyer have focused on the trenches. They'll, they load them up, and they want as many as they can. That way when you lose one, you've got another guy waiting to pick up the, the mantle and just go with it. And that's how you build consistency, and that's how you are able to overcome those injuries. You get a young guy like Zach Harrison right now getting some important reps. And by his sophomore season, I mean, he's going to be ready to go with Chase Young going off to the next level, this being Jonathan Cooper's last go round. You assume that you'll, 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 that Tyreek Smith and Tyler Friday will be your guys at end, but Zach Harrison will be right there in the in the two deep. I mean, they, they have a well-oiled machine going on right now on the defensive line. All right, it's Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. I bring in these fine gentlemen each and every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern time, and Tony certainly has a smirk on his face after I said fine gentlemen. Uh, each and every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern time, and I'm able to keep a straight face, so maybe I can play poker. 
Uh, and we talk Buckeyes football each and every week. And of course, this is the big Nebraska tilt. And of course, I'm going to let you know to subscribe. Also, if all you want to see is Ohio State football talk, you're going to see a little bit later than you see it here at the main channel. But I just carve up all the Buckeye talk, put it on the Ohio State channel, Mark Rogers TV, Ohio State. So you can check it out there. You don't have to weave through Auburn, Clemson, Oklahoma, and everybody else. Uh, if you're right here, uh, you can also grab my predictions, my weekly predictions, and I will brag about my record for, through the first three weeks, but we will disregard what my week four performance was like. <laughs> it was pretty rough. Uh, week five college football predictions. There's new life for me and everybody else uh, this Saturday, this weekend with my weekly predictions. Uh, you can grab that in the link below. But beyond that, I, I, I emphasize the predictions when I need to, but this week we'll emphasize the exclusive content you get when you grab the link in the description section below that says uh, next to Voice of College Football Community. And of course, even if you took my predictions, you could afford with the double your money, a hundred percent bonus with betnow.eu to grab that link and use the promo code MRTVCFB. And should I add another one now that we're in the holiday season of sorts? A lot of you shop early now that it's almost October. Do your Christmas shopping at Amazon. You grab the link in the description section below. It's the same shopping experience, but you contribute to the channel. All right. I believe unless we have other um, analysis uh, on the Huskers and the Buckeyes, it's time for predictions. Uh, Kevin, we'll start with you. Well, I, I think I already kind of played my hand a little bit by saying that I don't think Nebraska is going to be able to slow down Ohio State's uh, offense. I think Nebraska will do a decent job of getting to the edge with their with their offense. I think that we'll see Maurice Washington break a big play. I think, I think we I think we see some uh, some big connection between uh, J.D. Spielman and Adrian Martinez. You know, I, I think that Steve really kind of hit the nail on the head when he put Nebraska at about that twenty one point number. I, I agree with that one too. I just think it's going to be too much Ohio State offense at this point. Uh, I, I I see this game somewhere in the neighborhood around forty five twenty one Buckeyes. Okay, Steve. Yep, making sure my microphone's on there. Uh, I agree. I think that uh, Ohio State has the potential uh, to get back to starting a game fast, and uh, that could be critical for them if they can take the crowd out of this game early and uh, just make it about the 11-on-11 11 11 matchup on the field. I don't think there's uh, much debate which team's got the better team. Nebraska is coming off a game. I just looked at that box score where they had 679 yards total offense against Illinois, which must be defenseless this year. Uh, four turnovers, though, kept Illinois in the game, and uh, that was critical. So we'll see if Nebraska can maintain possession of the football, and they're going to move the chains on Ohio State, as I alluded to earlier. Between the 20s, they may get some yards, but – comes down to that red zone are they going to force field goals or are they going to force or uh, allow touchdowns and I think uh, that's what's going to decide the game other side I think uh, Justin Fields the offense uh, they're just sitting on a powder keg it seems like every week getting ready to explode and uh, the good feeling surrounding that offense maybe they'll they'll have a bad play or two here or there but you can't keep them down or four quarters. So I'm going to say 42 to 20. That's a little variation of what uh, Kevin picked, but uh, I'm going to say 42 20 in that range. And uh, that's what I'll go with tonight. I'm going to watch some more Nebraska in the morning and put my final, final print on it in the morning after I've watched them. It's been kind of a hectic week, but uh, I want to see a little bit more Nebraska to know what they're dealing with. But, uh, you know, an Ohio State could score more than 42 given uh, what what I think of the Nebraska defense, but uh, 42 20 is my pick right now. You know, Mark, I don't think you should, you know, you say you did good weeks one through three, and then you kind of dismissed your week four. Don't, don't do that. You know, um, you know, 75% of the time your picks work every time, you know, so just be proud of that. Go with that and be strong and don't let anybody tell you differently. This game, uh, I was going to go 40, 524, but then I see in this private chat that Kevin said that Nebraska is two for seven on field goals. And I'm sure Scott Frost knows that. So he probably thinks that a field goal isn't going to do much in this game. 
So now I'm kind of torn between 45-21 or 45-28. And maybe Nebraska gets a late touchdown. But I'm also, I don't know how Ohio State is going to kick a field goal because they're not very good at that either. But I do like 45-28. We'll say, I think 28 is too many. But I can't go 24 because they don't make field goals. So um, plus I have to go one further than than Steve and Kevin. Um, Yeah, I, I think the Ohio State offense is just right now it's looking like I, it wouldn't surprise me to see them get 63, something like that, and just go completely off in this one and just run through Nebraska as they have before. Uh, I think 63 is a pretty common score for Ohio State against the Huskers. And if Ohio State gives up some big plays in this one, I don't think that's a big deal because Nebraska does that. And sometimes those big plays happen. So, yeah. All right, you've talked me into it, 45-28 Ohio State. I don't know if that's enough to cover, depending on where the line is on kickoff. Yeah, it's around 17, 17 and a half the last I checked. Now, Nebraska, yeah, their original field goal kicker was hurt in week one or two, didn't kick against Colorado. They had all sorts of issues. They had a uh, situation down near the end of the game where they had a fourth and short and clearly should have went for it. They tried a field goal that would have won the game, and the kid, like, hooked it, and it wasn't even close. Uh, Lane McCallum kicked for them last week but did not attempt a field goal. Four for four on the extra points, but as Kevin mentions, two for seven for the team. And uh, Isaac Armstrong is their punter. Good punter. Tries his hand at field goals or his foot, I guess, he's what he actually tried and went uh, two for five on that two for seven. So I got Kevin at 45-21, Buckeyes, Tony at 45-28. Steve, once again, do you remember your score? I think it was from last week. No, for this week. 42-20, I said. 42-20. Now, what's uh, very puzzling about me jotting down these scores is every week I've done this, and then I instantly, like three minutes later, I throw the paper away. So I've never kept them. So they're gonna have to. We're gonna have to go through the video to find out. But this is the first week with some major suspense. Well, major suspense. I'm stretching it a bit, but a little curiosity to the predictions with the likes of Cincinnati, Miami of Ohio, et cetera, out of the way. Uh, Ohio State and Nebraska could be a a, a tremendous uh, scoring showcase on Saturday night. We shall see, or it could be a Buckeye blowout. I could see either way, but I certainly don't see Nebraska coming away with a win even at home. Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone, you got to join him for uh, Ohio State football coverage to get you set for the big game at Nebraska, as well as Steve Hellwagon at uh, 247 Sports Bucknuts and uh, Kevin Noon from Buckeye Grove. Guys, I appreciate you stopping by, as always, uh, supplying the information and the insight. See you next week. Enjoy the trip and enjoy the game. Absolutely. All right. Yep. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right.